the half Atwood machine is like an Atwood machine, but it's half of it, right? So an Atwood machine has a pulley with two masses. Uh, in the half Atwood, one of those masses is sitting on a frictionless table, and the other one's hanging over the table. So I'm going to come up with a solution for the equation of motion of this uh, using Lagrangian mechanics. So in Lagrangian mechanics, what you do, number one, you need to pick uh, some coordinates to describe the system. And I'm going to do that in a second. Once you do that, and I, they're generically called Q instead of X, Y, and Z. Just Q, whatever. It could be anything. With that, we determine the Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And then the trajectory of the system has to follow this equation, which is the Euler-Lagrange equation, which says that the uh, integral of L over some time has to be minimized, and the solution to that has to satisfy this. So that says the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the, the variable Q minus the time derivative of the partial with respect to Q dot, where Q dot is the derivative with respect to time, is equal to zero. So let's, I'm not going to, I have an explanation of Lagrangian mechanics. I just want to solve this problem. So the first thing that we're going to do is to define the system. And so it seems kind of difficult to pick some coordinates, so let's just pick coordinates and then figure it out from there. The, the first thing we want to think about is how many degrees of freedom. If How many numbers would I need to completely describe where this is at any given time? And, and the answer should be one, right? Because if this moves down, if I know the position of this one, then I should know the position of that one. So it, it may be a little bit of a difficult job to get them into actual usable coordinates, but let's just do it anyway. So here I have mass 1, here I have mass 2, so let's call this, let's have some arbitrary location, uh, and I'm going to call this distance y2. And y2 is going to tell me the location of mass 2. Now I could have over here uh, a variable called x1 to tell me the position of mass 1. And it, there is a case where you'd actually use both of those. But here, I want just one of them. So I know that if I go up here, which is going to be y2 plus this string, and then over here to the wall, that should be a constant length. Because as, as y2 decreases, x1 should increase. So I can write an equation of constraint like this. I can say uh, x1 plus y2 plus some constant, I'll call it c1 is equal, that's the length of the string. I didn't want to use L, you know why, right? You know why. Is equal to some other constant C2. That has to be true, right? That says this total length is constant. So the total length from here to there is constant C. Well, I can subtract both sides from C1 and get some other constant. And I can write this as X1 plus Y2 equals C. I'm just going to call it C. Okay, and I'm going to use that. Because now what I need to do is to get the kinetic energy of both of these masses. So, and the easiest way to get the kinetic energy, I can say T2 is one half, that's the kinetic energy of mass 2, M2, X2 dot squared plus Y2 dot squared. It's the velocity squared. So the velocity is, the, in the Cartesian coordinates, is the X velocity squared plus the Y velocity squared. Plus Z, I left off Z because Z went on vacation, Z's gone. Um, you could add z if you want, if that makes you happy. So for this case, y2 is a Cartesian coordinate, and it doesn't move in the x direction, so that's 0. So t2 is 1 half m2 y2 dot squared. What about the kinetic energy of that one? Well, t1 is 1 half m1 x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared. But if that stays on the table, then y1 is constant, and the derivative is zero, so that term goes away. But I have x1 dot squared. I don't want x1, I'll, I want one variable. So over here, let's solve this for x1. x1 equals c minus y2. Now I can take the derivative of this. The derivative of x1 is x1 dot, and I have to take the derivative of the right-hand side. So the derivative of c is just zero, and the derivative of negative y2 is negative y2 dot. Now I can put that in over here for x1. So x1 dot squared is going to be negative y2 dot squared. So this is going to be 1 half m1 y2 dot squared. So the total kinetic energy is the sum of those. Now what about the potential? Um, let's call this 
I shouldn't do that, really. I should, okay, let's not. I'm going to say this is y equals 0. I already did it down here. Let's be consistent. So the potential of this mass is going to be uh, m2 g y2 plus m1 g y1. I'm going to leave it like that. Now remember, y2 changes. y1 does not. Okay. y1 is constant. With that, I can write the Lagrangian L equals T. Now, notice these both have a Y2 dot squared, so I can write this as 1 half M1 plus M2 Y2 dot squared minus the potential. So it's going to be minus M2 G Y2 minus M1 G Y1. That's my Lagrangian. I only have one variable, Y right, y dot. So I can, I only need one of these Lagrange equations. So let's write this Lagrangian down. I'm going to just rewrite it. L one half m1 plus m2 y2 dot squared minus m2 g y2 minus m1 g y1. So that's what I have for my Lagrangian. Now I can use the Lagrangian the Euler-Lagrange equation. So just as a reminder, the partial of L with respect to y2 minus the derivative with respect to time of the partial of L with respect to y2 dot equals zero. So let's start with this first part, the partial of L with respect to y2. So this is a partial derivative. So if it, I'll, I'll treat everything as a constant except for y2. So which, where's y2 here? It's only one place right there, right? There's no y2s here. There's no y2s there. So I just need to take the derivative of this with respect to y2. And so I just get negative m2g. That's it. Okay, now let's do this. Let's just do the partial of L with respect to y2 dot. Okay, so where's y2 dot? There's only one y2 dot, it's right there. So if I take the derivative, I use the power rule. So I bring the two down, it's gonna, it's gonna multiply by the one half to give me one, and then that's gonna be raised to just the one power. So this is gonna be m1 plus m2 times y2 dot. Now I need to take the time derivative. Now there's only one thing that actually changes with time in this expression, that's y2 dot. So the derivative with respect to time of the partial of L with respect to y2 dot is going to be equal to this constant, m1 plus m2, times the time derivative of y2 dot, which is just going to be y2 double dot. Double dot means second derivative. So now this minus this is equal to 0, according to this. So I get minus m2g minus m1 plus m2 y2 double dot equals zero. I'm going to add this to both sides and I get, uh, I'm going to put it right, y2 m1 plus m2 equals negative m2g and if I divide both sides by m1 plus m2, y double dot equals negative m1g m2g, is that m2? Yeah, divided by m1 plus m2. And so that's a differential equation. But we're really done, right? Because we could we could play around with this for a while uh, if we wanted to. But um, it shows us something very important. m2, g, m1, m, m2 are constant. So this is just a constant acceleration. I could plug in my values for m1, m2, uh, and g and get the acceleration. And it says that the acceleration is negative. Is that, does that even make sense? Well, here's my picture, right? If this is positive y, this is going to accelerate this way. So it should be accelerating in the negative direction. It should fall down. Um, I can go over here and then find the acceleration for x. And so it's ne it's negative of, if I, if I take, actually, I'm sorry, I missed that part. So if I take the derivative, I get x1 double dot is negative y2 double dot. So now I have the acceleration for mass one and it's gonna be positive because y2 is negative, which means it's accelerating this way, which again, that makes sense. Now, what about, let's look at the special cases. What about the special case of 
M2 being very massive compared to M1. So M2 is super large right here. Well, then I have M2 over G times G divided by M1 plus M2. But M1 plus 2, M2 is very close to M2. So this is M2 over M2, and it cancels, and it would be approximately G. So for M2 much greater than M1, Y double dot is negative G. That makes sense, right? Because if I have this very, very low mass, nothing's really going to stop this from falling. It's just going to, it's essentially just free fall. And so it'd have an acceleration of negative G, and that's what we get. Now, what about uh, the case where M1 is very large? If this is super large compared to that, it shouldn't accelerate. It, it won't move at all. So if I go over here and I put very large value for M1, Y double dot is very close to zero. So for M1 much greater than M2, Y double dot is approximately zero. Uh, if you want to solve this y as a function of time, you can integrate this twice. If you did that, you'd get y as a function. This is y2. y2 as a function of time is y2, 0, the initial y position, plus y2, 0, dot, the initial y velocity, times t, plus uh, 1 half. I'll write this as y2, double dot, t squared. That's that acceleration right there. And that's just a plain kinematic equation. You can do that if you want. And that is the half Atwood machine with Lagrangian mechanics. And just to, if you check, if you go do this with other mechanics, uh, Newtonian mechanics, you get the same thing. That was fun, right? It was fun.